Hello everyone, uh, good evening and welcome to tonight's event. My name is Joe Chris and I'm from the uh, Festival of Debate. Um, the Festival of Debate is run from Sheffield and is a platform for people to come together to discuss the key social, environmental, political and economical and social uh, issues of the day. Um, all of our online events are, are free at the point of access, but if you're able to donate to the Festival of Debate and support the work that we do, uh, that would be much appreciated. There is a donate link on the Festival of Debate website, and you can also check out our, our full programme of upcoming events. We've got about uh, three weeks of the festival left to go. I'm very excited to introduce uh, tonight's event, which is titled what has the BBC ever done for us and is run in collaboration with Granville Williams. I'd just like to hand over now to our chair, Granville, if you'd like to turn your video and microphone on. You're muted, Granville, still. Thanks, Joe. Um, what I do want to do, first of all, uh, my name is Granville Williams. I edit Media North, and this event has been put on in partnership with Festival of Debate. And we put a bid in to do this event in uh, uh, late in the uh, last year because we thought that the BBC was going to be the subject of intense attack. And my goodness, that's been proved correct. So what we want to try and do tonight is, with, with the great panel of speakers we've got, is explore what's going on because since January this year, when uh, Nadine Doris, the culture secretary, announced a red meat announcement that she was going to freeze the license fee for two years with a, a massive impact on the BBC finances. And then of course, the remorseless attack on Channel 4 and the privatization of it. So there are big issues here about the future of public service broadcasting and the structures of it, which clearly this government is pretty intent on seeking to either weaken or dismantle. So I'd like to welcome the panelists and the, and the audience to the event. Um, the way we'd like to run it is that we're gonna have each of the speakers give short introductions, uh, outlining some of the points that they want to make and then some questions and discussion between the panelists and then open it up to the audience and i'll encourage you please to send in contribute with questions and, our, and so that we can get some answers to them so that's enough for me i'd like to start first of all with an introduction for peter york now, Peter is standing in, sadly, for Patrick Barwise. Patrick, even though he's been double jabbed and all the rest of it, like we all have, he has got COVID. And so Peter, the co-author with um, Patrick of the excellent book, The War Against the BBC, is going to stand. Granville, you're uh, muted again, unfortunately. Oh, sorry, uh, just a brief word about Peter. He's the president of the Media Society, but many of you will remember him for a book, a best-selling book that he did in the 1980s, the official Sloan Ranger Handbook. So over to you, uh, Peter, to set the scene about what you see as the threats to public service broadcasting as a result of the latest announcements and the previous attacks by the government on the BBC in Channel 4. Over to you. I'm going to say that again. Thank you, Granville. Um, what I'm going to do um, first, because we're dealing with a very myth-making, very assertive government, uh, which doesn't allow challenges to its framing of the issues. I'm going to take the motion, what has the BBC ever done for us, very literally, in our book, showing here, as you did, 
highly recommended, The War Against the BBC, Patrick Obawise and I set out to show what the BBC does, what proportion of the UK population use it, and what happens when they're forcibly deprived of it. Because dip, misreading that is the basis of disinformation. Then, if there's time, later I'll get on to the more conceptual benefits of the BBC, the pump priming of the British creative industries, the great investment on all in original British product, the delivery of soft power via the World Service and other things, social cohesion in a time of great polarization, all that stuff. We can get on to that stuff. But first, what does the BBC ever do for us? The license fee is 159 quid. A license fee is for a household, not just an individual. It's three point something of pounds per household per week or 40 something P a day. What can you buy for 40 something P a day? Just think about that one. Here's what you actually get. Here's the BBC's menu. Um, it's not all of it, but this is the basics. Six national TV channels, 13 regional TV news programs and some other regional programs, 10 national and 40 local radio stations, huge a range of online services, including iPlayer and Sounds. The BBC Three used to be online, but has got back on. Um, to live. And it's worth saying that BBC Online is by far the most popular UK owned website, especially for news, sport, and weather reports. Then let's go on to who uses it. The fact that is in, in terms of penetration, as marketeers like to say, not spend, that's not the important thing, penetration, the BBC remains the biggest brand in the land. The, the idea that there's a significant group of households paying the license fee, but getting no benefit from it, turns out to be almost entirely mythological. That doesn't stop a group of non-dom right-wing billionaire British national newspapers saying it, but it isn't true. Like many unexamined claims about the BBC, even in a single week, 99% of households consume at least some BBC services. At an individual level, 91% of people use one or more of the BBC services in a single week. How much do they use? The key measure here is a marvelous dry metric, the average weekly, uh, weekly user hours per households. It sounds dry, doesn't it? But it's massive. So if you divide the weekly cost, the three point something pounds of the license fee by the weekly usage, you get the cost per user hour. It's a pretty relatable measure of the value for money of the license fee for the average household. In 2018, 2019, the average UK adult over 16 in a TV household was consuming just over 18 hours of BBC services at TV, radio, online, with an average of 1.93. I told you it was going to be dry, adults per household. That means 35 adult user hours per household per week, excluding the under 16. So the average cost per adult user hour was a bit over 9p. There's not a lot you can do with 9p an hour. Now, there is a consistent story and a consistent rumble of complaint of people who pay the license fee, but say they'd rather not, who say they don't get value that they recognize from it. Well, uh, in 2015, the BBC published a deprivation study. 
And what that meant, they took away all the BBC services from that minority of households who said in a survey that the license fee didn't offer good value for money. They had nine days without any BBC service, but they were given a cash payment equivalent to the cost of the BBC over those nine days, not very much money. At the end of that period, two thirds of those households changed their minds. They decided that the license fee did represent good value for money after all. Now, very recently, in April of this year, the BBC published the results of a repeat of that study. The results were practically identical, though since 2014 stroke 15, 23 mainstream content streamers were launched, bringing the total of mainstream streamers to 38. So immensely changing the, the notional competitive situation. The basics of the BBC are universal. The basics of the BBC should remain universal. It's very impressive. It's very good value for money. There's a huge range of services across the platforms, the nations and the regions. There's a near universal uptake of them amongst UK adults across a given week. And there's a continuing acknowledgement that the license fee really, really is value for money. Comparisons between the BBC and Netflix are utterly dishonest. But those are the comparisons made by Nadine Doris, a minister who does not know her brief, who does not know the economic model of Channel 4, or the status of Channel 5, which she thinks was formerly a state-owned channel which was privatized and then became utterly wonderful. Um, I'm not going to go on to the big conceptual stuff. We can come back to that. But the big conceptual benefits, the ones you would have to argue about, um, pump priming of the British creative industries, the greatest investment of all in British uh, original British television product, the delivery of soft power by the World Service and social cohesion. You know, during a pandemic, health advice, instant education for your kids, all that sort of thing. Those are the basics of the BBC and they're staggeringly impressive. We must not lose them. Right. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Peter, for that introduction. So lots of facts and figures there, very important to demolish some of the myths about those that we would want to argue for defunding the BBC. Um, I want to move on to our second speaker, Dorothy Byrne. Dorothy has an absolutely distinctive track record working across um, Granada, World in Action, ITV, the big story, and of course, as head of news and current affairs at Channel 4. Now, Dorothy is the president of Murray Edwards College in Cambridge. But Dorothy, um, I, I think is a, a good exemplar, if you want, of the kind of uh, public service broadcaster who has seen the value in terms of both the news and documentary and uh, current affairs production and dispatches has been an incredibly important strand in that. So I'd like to hand over now to Dorothy to present her take both on the current situation in terms of broadcasting and maybe to talk particularly about Channel 4. Over to you, Dorothy. Thank you very much indeed, Granville. Uh, Peter has talked in a very convincing way about some of the statistics about how good the BBC is. Uh, the BBC has also got some things about it that aren't so good. And I've been very critical of the BBC at times and have even, some people will be horrified to know, 
um, written an article recently in the Daily Mail, no, the Mail on Sunday, criticizing um, some of what the BBC did about Martin Bashir. I sometimes think that BBC News is boring and is insufficiently challenging to the establishment. So I don't sit here just going, the BBC is absolutely fantastic. Um, but I think what you have to do is say, well, if you think there, that you have some criticisms of the BBC, what would you do about it? Oh, well, I've got a good idea. You just destroy it. Well, that is not a good thing to do when you're not very happy about something. Now, um, the, Nadine Doris has said um, that the license fee has been around for 100 years. And I've, I, you hear this a lot, that the license fee and the BBC, the way they've been run has been very similar for a very long period of time, as if this is in itself an argument for getting rid of something. If we thought that, we might get rid of the monarchy, we might get rid of democracy, we might knock down parliament. That isn't a very good argument. But say you did think you should replace the license fee, you would do that in a really thoughtful way. You would first of all work out, well, what are we going to replace it with? And what is really deranged about what's happening at the moment is that it was announced at 2 a.m. in a tweet that the days of the current way of organizing the BBC were up. Um, that, and that, you know, we were ready to go to a new model. But the whole point is we're not ready. So I do think it's probably a good idea for our society to hold a discussion on have we got the right model for the BBC? But you hold the discussion first and you come up with your alternative plan before you announce that this is what you are going to do. That is a really bad way to organize things. So let's look at why we need all this radical action. Why is it that we need to get rid of the license fee and privatize Channel 4? I worked for Channel 4 for more than 20 years, and I've worked in British public service broadcasting for most of my life. During that time, again and again, I have been asked to go to other countries to speak to them about how we got such a brilliantly successful television industry, a television industry that has brought billions into our economy. Every industry would want to have been as successful as the television industry has been, but also which has played such a key role in democratic debate in this country. So you have the BBC, ITV, Channel 5, but particularly the BBC and Channel 4, both as truly public service broadcasters, competing with each other to bring you excellent news and current affairs and giving you very different views of the world. Maybe not as different as you might want, but there is a big difference between Channel 4 News and Dispatches and BBC News. And if you take away the license fee at around the same time as you privatize Channel 4, again, the privatization of Channel 4 being done with no proper thought, you are dismantling an extraordinarily successful broadcasting landscape in this country. Everybody is worried about the lack of interest in British politics and the lack of trust in politicians. That concern goes across all political parties. Why at that time would you undermine the strength and power of news and current affairs, both on the BBC and on Channel 4? This is a, a, 
really not a time to do it. And you have to see the attack on the BBC and the attack on Channel 4 as being the same thing. They are not two separate things. And that's why I'm talking about the privatization of Channel 4 in a debate when I've been asked to talk about the BBC. Because if, private, if Channel 4 is privatized, it, at the moment, it doesn't make any profit at all. And it doesn't make any of its own programs. So it's holding up many, many dozens of companies, independent companies outside London, around the, this country, and enabling them to make programs from all different perspectives. But it is also producing one hour of prime time news and a lot of current affairs. Are we really expected to believe that after privatization, when a major company will buy Channel 4, that they will carry on making very high quality news for one hour, approximately a third of it is international. It's very expensive investigative news. Are we really meant to believe it will carry on being like that? It won't. It will gradually be eaten away. It will become shorter. It will become cheaper. It will be moved. And are we really expected to believe that if you take away the license fee, whatever they say about how, and they will tell you this, they will tell you this both about BBC and Channel 4, we will protect news and current affairs. But we know from the way that things have changed when uh, other organizations were privatized, that it doesn't take that long. You'd be lucky if it's three years before what these organizations do in the way of news and current affairs is watered down. And they're not just telling you about the world. BBC News and Channel 4 News are key to upholding our democracy. And I think we are all really concerned about democracy and the, the weakness of our democratic debate among some very weak politicians at the moment. And this is not the moment to be undermining democracy further by weakening our brilliant news and current affairs on our public service broadcasters. So, you know, what has the BBC done for you? Well, I'll tell you, it has informed and defended democratic information and debate in this country. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Thank you ever so much, Dorothy. Uh, and a really good, there, there are two, two good speakers to set us off. I want to change tack a little bit. Our next speaker is Paulette Edwards. Paulette is a presenter on the mid morning uh, programme for Radio Sheffield. Um, and before Paulette speaks, I just want to, I was reminded last night, I was at my uh, National Union Journalist branch meeting. And we had a guest speaker called Charlotte Leeming. So if you live in the Yorkshire area, you would remember Charlotte. She worked for Look North for 20 years, did great work. And she was talking about her experience. And what came across so clearly was that what you get from uh, BBC regional television and from BBC local radio stations like BBC Sheffield or uh, BBC Leeds is a different picture. It's a different audience, actually, often to what we get on our national radio and television and different topics. So I'm delighted to hand over now to Paulette, who's going to present her take on the topics we're discussing tonight. Over to you, Paulette. Thank you very much, Granville. And I'm going to go um, a little bit foot soldier on this. And um, 
I'm going to dwell a little bit on the us in what, in, what has the BBC done for us. And I'm going to kind of start off with me, really, what it's done for me, because my mum says when I was a little girl, I used to go up to the telly, put my finger on the BBC One Globe, which was the ident when I was little, and say BBC One. And I remember watching children's programmes like Magic Roundabout, Rhubarb and Custard, Will of the Wisps, Mary Mungo and Midge. And the reason we watch these programmes is because they used to be on before the BBC News and my dad was always lurking, waiting for the news. I also remember my dad on a Saturday morning, uh, so he watched the Western on BBC Two and then he'd call one of us, a six, I've got five siblings, from the hallway, using us as a remote control to turn the telly on to the wrestling for World of Sport on ITV. So I knew my parents trusted the BBC, I knew they trusted the news, I wasn't aware there was any competition or real difference between ITV and the BBC because there were programmes that we watched. So we watched Love Thy Neighbour, that was about the racial conflicts between black and white neighbours on ITV, if you never saw it. We watched the black and white minstrels on the BBC. We did think it was strange, but there wasn't that much alternative for us, really. There were only three channels. My mum and dad managed to find humour in all of it. They became quite accustomed to not being visible in the media and being criticised, and they had their own way of dealing with that. So my parents felt like visitors and the lack of diversity was what they expected as they planned to return home to Jamaica. And as it worked out, neither of them did. So I had a portable telly when I went to study at Huddersfield Polytechnic. And to be honest, I hardly switched it on between 1982 and 1986. And I'm, I'm sure I missed quite a lot of good telly. I did my A-levels in front of the telly with my five siblings running around and my parents. Don't remember much of that telly. But then this happened. Um, I taught, I was a teacher until I was 34, and then I developed um, fluid on the brain. It's called benign intracranial, intracranial hypertension. So it led to surgery, and that meant that I had to resign from teaching for a while until I was fit enough to go back. And it was around that time that the internet started to get a little bit keen, and uh, I noticed in the Sheffield Star, there was an advert for stories from ordinary people, written by ordinary people about ordinary things happening in South Yorkshire. Um, to fill their web pages, obviously. And my friend was working as a drama teacher in a school. She was doing a production of Kez. So I interviewed her, I interviewed the children, and I went across to interview Barry Hines, who wrote Kestrel for a Knave, um, who was lecturing at Sheffield Hallam University at the time. I had a chat with him. I put it all together. I brought it back to BBC Radio Sheffield, and they said, oh, thank you very much. They were really pleased with it. And uh, while I was coming in and out doing other bits and pieces, they realised that they needed um, someone on reception, someone to work in their open centres. I don't know if you know much about that, but when uh, I started at the BBC in, in the year 2001, I think it was, they had open centres helping ordinary people to access the internet and running courses and things like that downstairs at Shoreham Street, which is where we are now. So my curiosity got the better of me. I started to inquire about what was going on, what was coming out of the speakers. And I spent some time with Onnie Bright, who did the Friday show. She asked me to do the Watsons, a very important part of local radio. Um, I had a chat on air and one of the managers heard me and said, have you ever thought about broadcasting? And of course I hadn't. I was, um, you know, I'm a daughter of Jamaican immigrants from Pittsmore. Of course, I hadn't thought about working for the BBC, being on local radio. I'd never, ever thought about it was the truth. But anyway, one thing led to another. And, and here I am. I am broadcasting, as Granville says, um, on BBC Radio Sheffield. So what has the BBC done for me? Well, it gave me an opportunity to do something that I never would have thought possible. And if I ask you what you see when you look at me, what words come to mind? You may have heard me. You may think that because of what you see, you know me. You may think that I'm a handful of different things. You may think about the colour of my skin, my ethnicity, what I'm wearing. You may have clocked my ring. Is she engaged? Is she married? She likes to wear makeup. You may think, you know, my gender, sexuality, beliefs, thoughts, desires, social status, political persuasion, what makes me laugh, how I was at school, what I like to eat, where I live, what car I drive. The truth is that none of us really knows anything about anyone else. And the fact that we think we do is the challenge and what the BBC has actually done for me.
So it's given me an opportunity to challenge the way that I see every single individual who sits in front of me for an interview or calls into the show or sends a text or talks about a variety of things like, you know, famous people. I spoke to Michelle Collins today. She didn't very much like being called Cindy Beale. Um, I've spoken to key workers, people who are retired. I've spoken to people during the pandemic who didn't know where to get food from. Um, Roni Robinson spoke to a man who was trapped in his wardrobe and he didn't ring 999, he called Roni Robinson. So people who are retired, younger people, cat lovers, people who let their pets sleep in their bed and people who may or may not wear shoes in their houses. So the BBC has made me challenge every lazy stereotype, assumption or presumption that I have and continues to challenge that. And I think that is one of the most significant things that the BBC has done for me. And I think it is one of the BBC's most important roles to challengers. So when Sir David Attenborough talks about nature, he challenges what we think we know about animals and what they do. When Richard Osmond and Alexander Armstrong are with us from Pointless, they challenge what we know about how popular things are or not popular things are. Uh, when Strictly Come Dancing is on, we get Tess Daly and Claudia Winkleman challenging what we think we know about dancing and how well famous people can dance. Would I like to see more of this? Of course I would. Is there enough of this? I don't think there is. I was appalled and disgusted by the accounts of the experiences of members of the black community across, you know, what they'd known. I know it was fictionalized in small acts by director Steve McQueen. I was angry about the things I only knew a little bit about, the things that my parents had protected me from, the things that had not been made clear in history. I adored the memory of the importance of Althea and Donna's reaching number one in Lover's Rock, and, the, and I relish the depth that David Olusoga goes to to help black British people in particular, but actually all of us, to understand the significance of knowing the truth about black history. Britain's role in it, of course, is important and the consequences and the legacy. So all of that, this is all new. I was born in 1964 in Sheffield and all of this is in the last couple of years. Michaela Cole's I May Destroy You left me angry, upset and battered from being in a familiar yet unfamiliar world. And she also challenged others to write about what they experienced, warts and all. We make a big mistake if we think what the BBC can do for us is just to reflect. Our responsibility is to take on the big and not easy challenge of asking for what we want, creating what we want and making demands on the BBC that belongs to all of us. 9p, I think it was that uh, Peter said, was it an hour? 9p, I've just got three bags of Haribo Jelly Babies, they're excellent by the way, for a pound. And I thought that was a bargain. I'm just throwing that in there. So we all have a responsibility. It belongs to all of us. I work for the BBC, but I'm also a consumer of the BBC. And I used to, it used to really annoy me when people call the BBC anti because it meant that they had an easy relationship with the BBC. Um, they were in, had an entitled relationship with the BBC. Aunties give you sweets, they spoil you, they give you things your parents won't give you. Should the BBC be our auntie, it's not my auntie if I'm honest. And if so, should it, I think if it is our auntie, it should be like my auntie Sissy who used to challenge me and help me to be my best. And uh, so she saw me and um, she had a set of false teeth. She had uh, four front teeth on a plate. She used to put it down her bra. And if anyone came to the house, she took it, she put them in straight away. Uh, she used to make me laugh and uh, she used to make me feel special. So if you don't feel reflected and if you want to tell your story, and if you're not hearing what you need, ask or tell the BBC. I'd never have the confidence to say what I'm saying now if I'd not worked at the BBC. It's exciting to go to London or to Salford to see the magic and be to be a part of it. But yes, there needs to be more diversity and we all need to feel challenged by what we see and what we hear. My mother actually cried when she saw the first article about me in the Sheffield Star, about my role as a presenter in the BBC. And she said, when me and your dad came from Jamaica, we wanted our children to do well and to have a better life, but we never ever expected to see our children presenting for the BBC, working for the BBC. That's what the BBC did for me and did for us. So things are moving. I don't think I would have considered a presenter I don't think I would have been considered rather as a presenter 30 years ago. Things are moving, but if they're not moving enough, what can you do for the BBC? 
Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Paulette. Some really interesting points there. And from a perspective down there, I, I saw, saw when I read the interview that you did in the, in the Star, that you born and bred, lived in Sheffield in the area all your life. So you know it. I, I grew up in Sheffield. I must say Sheffield made me. It was a great city to grow up in. Um, over now to Tom, Tom Mills. Tom um, is the chair of the Media Reform Coalition. And he's uh, the author of an absolutely central read, a book called The BBC, The Myth of a Public Service. Um, the Media Reform Coalition that uh, Tom's involved in has had a, uh, done two interesting, lively, thoughtful reports. So one report on the BBC and its future vision, and it's done a short comment about the privatization, the vindictive, I think called a vindictive and political act, the privatization of Channel 4. So over to you, Tom, to present your perspectives on the theme of tonight's event. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much, Grenville. Thanks for having me. And um, it's great to be here with such an important issue. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it's being something that we're discussing, but also something that I think, I hope anyway, that we can reflect on uh, critically about the nature of the BBC. I find myself in a slightly unusual position in some of these debates because I tend to be seen as uh, a critic of the BBC. And in British public life, people who criticise the BBC tend to be coming from the right and the sort of, you know, the culture wars, which tend to be sort of circling around the government and the right wing press. But that's certainly not where I come from. And I don't particularly consider myself to be a critic of the BBC. But what I have tried to do in, in my work and what I've tried to build on in some of the policy work that I've done with others at the Media Reform Coalition, which is led at the moment by Debs Grayson on our Beyond the BBC project, is to think about the BBC not as we would like it to be, but to, to think about the BBC as it is, and then think about, well, how can we ensure the future of the BBC in a way that I think doesn't fall back onto sort of nostalgic or starry-eyed kind of defences about, about what the BBC is. Now, I, I think there's been lots of really important contributions from the people who've spoken before me, and I don't want to contradict any of that. I mean, I think Peter's book, for example, is a really useful resource for um, analysing and exposing some of the cynical arguments that get most mobilised by the right about the BBC. I suppose the sort of plea that I would make to people is that to some extent though we don't get too boxed into the details of these particular arguments about the BBC, about the particular programmes it produces, because a lot of that is responding to the sort of noise and nonsense that's coming from the government. Um, for example, around the cost of the license fee, around these sort of culture war ideas, and as Peter mentioned earlier, some of these comparisons with Netflix, which are completely, are completely disingenuous. I think it's very important that we don't get boxed in by all that stuff. Um, but I think we also need to recognise that we are genuinely going through a period of quite profound change in the structures of the media. And I think we really do need to make a, an urgent intervention there for public media. And I think that has to mean, on the one hand, recognising all of the benefits of the BBC. It has to be exposing some of the right wing arguments that get mobilised against the BBC. And as I said, I think Peter's book is, is a very useful resource for that. But it has to also open up the, the, this, this sort of debate about what, what the, not only the BBC, but public media more broadly mean um, in the 21st century. Now, Nadine Doris, once she stopped making these like very um, scary threats against the BBC when she went to Parliament, she sort of took on a slightly more conciliatory tone and said something along the lines of, let's discuss what a BBC in 2027 will, will, will look like. Let's have a debate. Um, this is what she claimed, I presume the civil servants wrote, um, tagged that onto the end of her speech. I think we should be having that debate. We are going to be coming up to the end of the Royal Charter, and we need to, by the time we reach that point, and hopefully we'll have a different government with different inclinations, have a sense of what we want the BBC to be in the 21st century. And I would argue that we do not want to simply replicate the um, achievements of 20th, the 20th century institution that we've inherited. There are very important elements of that that we need to replicate, but we need to be as forward looking as possible. Now, to a certain extent, I think that John Cleese sketch, which the, the title of this event is, is based on, what has the BBC ever done for us? You know, it, it was kind of a good piece of like, you know, advertising for the BBC. But I think to a certain extent, 
it wasn't a very good move because it shifted the debate around the BBC onto this question of like value for money. Now, again, like Peter's made some important points about the value of money that the BBC gives us. But I think we can, we can think sort of less transactionally about the BBC because when we think about public media, I don't think we should think about it in terms of, right, the BBC, I give you X money, what do you give me every week? And I, I, you know, I'm not disagreeing with Peter's points about the value of the BBC output and the scope of its activities. But the problem is if we start to think transactionally, then we, we start to lose sight of the entire point of public media, which is a point that was actually already been made um, by Dorothy, I think, that it's about having a set of institutions that undergird participation in public life, right? It is, it is about democratic participation, but not about just about formal democratic participation, the sort of Westminster century reporting we get from the BBC, but the ac universal access to information and culture that I think undergird social participation. That's the point of public media, right? And that's what we want the BBC to do. Commercial media will not do that, whether it's advertised funded media, um, whether it's other, you know, if it's, if it's not regulated in like particular, you know, very, very strict um, public service requirements, it will not be producing programming or information which will be able to do that. We, for very obvious reasons, we shouldn't have billionaire owned media, media and we don't want big, like we don't want multinational corporations in, in charge of our, this, this collective resource. So that's why we need public media. And then the question becomes, well, what kind of public media do we want? Now at the Media Reform Coalition, when we try to move away somewhat from this sort of, you know, quasi-commercial relationship that we're, where, where we, we think about the license fee as some um, payment which we make in return for the BBC giving us something back. You know, the way that I would like to think about this is more like, look, the license fee, and this is like really a point that, that Tony Ager from the B BBC has made, is that the license fee should be a claim on our on on our collective um, culture and access to this, this universal resource, right? That it's, it's almost like it has a sort of symbolic role. And the, the way we start to think about this in the Media Reform Coalition is with, with this idea of the media common. So instead of thinking about the, very narrowly in terms of the BBC, where we like the BBC, what are the BBC's programs like, blah, 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 blah which just creates all, all of these sort of um, very sort of heated arguments about the institution, we start to think, well, what kind of media do we want to support the kind of society that we need? And I think then we have to think about a public media which is independent, which is accountable, which is democratic and which is universal. Now, the universe is absolutely crucial because that, that's the element of public media which is gonna ensure equal participation. That's why we can't have any movement towards subscription services. Now, I think quite frankly, the government hasn't really thought through what it wants to do with the BBC. And I think that this does create an opening for us. But in terms of independence, and in terms of accountability, in terms of like democratic accountability to the people who work there and to the audiences, I think we have to be quite frank um, that the BBC basically has never met this kind of standard. Now, um, Dorothy mentioned that she thought the BBC wasn't sufficiently challenging the establishment. And, you know, that's absolutely correct. I mean, the, historic, the, the, the scholarly record on the BBC is very, very clear in terms of the, to the, the, the nature of its reporting, in terms of its relationship with the political class. And these are all problems which we can resolve. And this is the thing, like people, um, I think the BBC in recent years is, is losing support. And I think that if we're going to offer a convincing and strong defense of the BBC, a 21st century BBC, then we can't fall back on these kind of starry eyed or nostalgic defenses about what the BBC is. We need to think about its funding model, right? And the government makes this argument about targeting low income groups, which frankly is an incredible nerve from, from this government. But the reason those kinds of arguments work is that the, the license fee is a regressive tax, right? So we should be honest about that and we should offer new forms of funding. Um, and as Dorothy emphasized, this, this isn't about, um, we, these shouldn't be panic responses. This should be considered public debates. I mean, that, that's what's so outrageous about the way the government's been behaving in relation not only to the BBC, but also to Channel 4. But we need to be having debates about governance. We need to be having debates about the personnel and the culture at the BBC. Frankly, the evidence is overwhelming that the BBC is a highly politicized institution. And in order for the BBC to perform its constitutional, if you like, function, it needs to be genuinely independent of government. And it needs to be more representative of the audience that it, it, it claims to represent. So these are all existing problems with the BBC, which are well known, 
um, not controversial, except in certain company where people get upset about these things. Um, and they're becoming more widely accepted, I think, as the BBC has shifted towards um, um, its culture has become more politicized and it's become more co commercialized. So these are all issues and problems for which there are policy solutions. And I think we need to be having a, a, a very honest and open and serious public debate, which is the opposite of what the government wants. And that, that's why I'm very, very glad to be um, part of this panel. So I will just finish by saying sort of in summary that there are, you know, there's a lot of details here and there's a, a lot of proposals that I've been involved in. But I would say, broadly speaking, we need to be thinking about moving away from a sort of I suppose politically compromised um, status broadcaster funded by regressive taxation and moving towards um, a devolved public platform which is uh, has secure and equitable funding and is genuinely independent of politicians and representative of, of audiences and then the BBC will be able to genuinely perform the kind of social and political function that is claimed of it but I, I think it, I think you know we need to work in order to get there um, Paula mentioned earlier, you know, having to complain about the BBC, having to get involved in the BBC, and I absolutely agree, but I think that means not just asking for things at the BBC. Frankly, I think a lot of these things, the current leadership of the BBC are not gonna deliver. It has to be making ambitious claims on what kind of BBC we want, because as Paulette said, the BBC should belong to us. And that's what's unique about public broadcasting. We have democratic rights to make claims on the BBC. And that also involves, I think, resisting the claims that the government makes on the BBC. So it means defending the BBC, and it means imagining what the BBC could, could look like um, for the next 50 to 100 years. And that has to be a democratic debate, and it can't be something that's just railroaded through um, by a small number of like highly ideological and, and frankly, extremely um, reckless figures uh, in Downing Street. I will leave it there. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, you've raised some good points there. Just a minute, am I? No, I'm not muted. Uh, thank you very much. But you've raised some good points there about how we need to be forward thinking uh, about the BBC. I'm aware that we've got two issues on the go here. We've got the immediate focus, which is in the broadcasting white paper to Queen's speech about Channel 4. And then, of course, there is the broader issue about the uh, review of the BBC in 24 and then the charter renewal coming up. So maybe we could focus first of all on Channel 4 and what, what seems to be involved there. I mean, first of all, it, it struck me that the, the white paper was where we had that first revelation about the details of the number of responses to the consultation, of which 97% were against privatisation. So we have um, a situation where, and, and by the way, in which Nadine Doris dismissed those people who had responded to the 38 degrees uh, and saying this was just online activism to be dismissed. Puzzlingly, really, when you think you put a tick a box when you vote, but you don't give evidence for your reason for doing it. So I think there's an issue that we need to focus on in terms of Channel 4, and maybe we could deal with that first. So can I ask uh, any of the people on the panel to respond to that? What do we think? I mean, clearly, the, the, the government hasn't got a case. There was when the consultation opened and afterwards. But what's going on? What, it, what is it that they uh, are about here? And what should we be doing uh, now that we know that the government is actually fixed on trying to get it, the channel privatised by the end of the, this uh, government's term? So anybody like to start there, please? Dorothy? Well, I feel in no doubt at all that this is the government throwing a bit of red meat to some of its very right wing supporters in order to distract from the problems that it's got. I, over decades, talked a lot to Conservative MPs of all sorts, and I found that actually Conservative MPs were in fact more likely to watch Channel 4 News than Labour MPs were. And they, 
they liked it. I mean, they liked it not least, of course, because they were on it, but they really appreciated the fact it was one hour of very serious news. So uh, it's not that the Conservative Party and Conservative voters as a whole won or really have any interest at all in privatizing Channel 4. You know, um, there's another survey that came out showing that 53% of people didn't even know that they owned Channel 4. And Nadine Doris used this as an argument to criticize Channel 4. Well, I would say if you own something and you don't even know you own it, that's in fact rather a good sign because it's not causing you any problem at all. Channel 4 doesn't cost the public any money at all and it makes money for companies around the United Kingdom. 50% of new content comes from outside London and the Southeast. So it's, it's creating lots of wealth and it, it, it's not in any debt at all. Now, wouldn't you like to be Channel 4 if you were the British government? So this is something that you own it and it costs you nothing uh, and it makes lots of money. And, uh, it, you know, it, it would be a no brainer to say, well, that thing works. Let's carry on doing it. Instead, what the government says is that Channel 4 cannot compete against Netflix and Amazon because it, it's not big enough. It will never be big enough. And it's not trying to compete against Amazon and Netflix. It's not trying to create Bridgerton. Much more to the point, I would just say finally, is that Netflix and Amazon cannot compete against Channel 4 because Channel 4 and the BBC make programmes just for us, just for our country, so that they contribute to the democratic debate in this country. Netflix and Amazon wouldn't even pretend that they can do that. We are about to destroy two major cultural institutions that help uphold the framework of our democracy. And you say, what can you do? Well, I say, what you can do is write to your conservative MP, because she or he probably wasn't that keen on this idea anyway, and just say, we don't want it. Can you sort out all the other problems in Britain, please? Thanks for that, Dorothy. Anybody else from the panel want to come in on this? Yeah, um, I can, if that's okay. Um, so I think basically, you know, agree with everything that was just said. The um, I'm surprised, slightly surprised, the government's going ahead with this. But they're obviously feeling slightly more confident than they were a, a few months ago. Um, it is an act of um, cultural and political vandalism, I think. Um, and but it stems from the assumption, basically, that number one, anything is going to be better in the private sector now. But, or at least that's the way the things tend to get described. This is sort of an ideological assault on like public um, ownership. And I, th I think there's some truth to that. I think more broadly, though, where this government is coming from is that any uh, there's been an ongoing erosion of public service broadcasting, basically. And although the Channel 4 is, um, is, is in a sense, is commercial, its commissioning model is based on a very different rationale, which is which is all public. And that's that's what's being constantly eroded that's what's been eroded actually for decades which has kind of given us the channel 4 we have now which is i, th I think you know there again as with the bbc there there are problems and we can make channel 4 better and we have some ideas for how we could do that i think for one thing we could get rid of advertising there is a genuine problem with channel 4 in the medium to long term not in the not in the short term so the government's just talking nonsense basically i mean they, they don't have a case as, as, as other people have said 
But there is a long term issue, which is that basically advertising revenue will be declining because it's moving online. Right. So we need to think about, well, what, what, how, what can we do about that? And I think what we've argued in the Media Reform Coalition is, well, you tax online advertising and you channel that money into Channel 4. And that means we can have a platform in Channel 4 with no advertising. I mean, and if you ask people what they want, a lot of people want a channel with no advertising that's free. That's why people like the BBC. Right. Although we pay the license fee. So. The reason why the, the government's doing this is because there, there's this constant effort to erode the public service requirements, which is what means that the BBC and Channel 4 deliver all the stuff that, that Dorothy just mentioned. And the reason and the reason why net, this comparison with Netflix is just complete nonsense. I mean, like Dorothy said, the Channel 4 is not, it, you know, we're not comparing the same thing here. Like, number one, like Netflix is got, it's an, an international like uh, it's a huge company which has expanded massively, like funded by debt, it, and it, it doesn't have any of those public requirements. And that's ultimately what the Conservatives are trying to erode here. And, and as others have said, they just simply don't have any de democratic mandate for it. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean that they won't do it. I mean, look what happened with Royal Mail, for example. You know, they, the, the, no, no um, mandate, no public support, but they drove it through anyway. So I think there is a genuine, there is a genuine threat here. Um, but that's where the government's coming from. You can see it with their, I, I forget what it's called, um, public service broadcasting advisory group or something. You know, it's, yeah. it's all, it's all um, private sector, big companies that are um, that are driving this stuff. Um, well, I should say that most of the industry don't even support it. I mean, that's the crazy thing. Yeah. Okay. I think you want to come in, Peter. Unmute, Peter. Peter. Sorry, Peter, you're uh, muted. You clicked to unmute. Unmute. Look, you can hear me now? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's an international playbook, this. Don't just think of this country. The, the attack on public service broadcasting, we can see most clearly in the organization of Hungary's structures. It's a playbook that Steve Bannon takes around the world with the other advice that he gives populists in the making and populist governments. And we know, don't we, that Steve Bannon, because he said so, co-wrote our prime minister's resignation statement and therefore his application for the top job. We have to recognize that across the world, where there is a decline in democracy as, me as um, measured by The Economist, this is part of the deal. You, uh, you attack public service broadcasting. You, you give public service broadcasting and other media into the hands of rich supporters. That's how it works. So it doesn't have to have any logic. You have to, you have to make it very clear what's happening. And what they do all the time, if you, um, if you have a vendetta against a much loved public institution where it's based on ideology, um, cohort greed and self-protection, obviously it's all Dorothy's fault because she said, and um, she said some rather rude things about our prime minister. And if you don't, if you want to protect that, you don't talk about any of those things. You talk about what I call false technological determinism. We love Channel 4, but the way the world is going, Channel 4 is going to be dwarfed by all these huge multifunded global organizations. Therefore, we have to privatize it. We, if one can expose where this particular vendetta comes from, what the precedents are, like the fact that January the 6th is the direct result of Fox and Friends, then, then I think we can nail the lie. And I don't think people should be at all shy about nailing the lie. I can just add to that. I mean, I think technological determinist arguments, as, as Peter mentioned, you know, these have been going on since the 1980s. I mean, the same group of people with the same like the same um, ambitions 
have been making these same claims that oh the technology is moving in this way it's nothing to do with politics and, and it's, it's just all complete nonsense one thing i would say we do have on our side which is that if the government isn't forced to make it an actual case and defend why it's doing what it's doing then it will just do it you know that's the thing they, they, they're not it's not like they have a good reason to do it but they will become that, that's why they become politically weaker if if the the, the case is forced on them. In other words, if they have to justify what they're doing politically and they can see there's a political cost for it, that's that's where they're weakest. So that's when the ideas matter. But I, do, I don't think we should be looking at ideas and be like, oh, why are they doing this? And assuming that they, that, you know, that they've got a clear plan or that they take seriously like the, the um, you know, because if you just read the statements that they make, I mean, they're, they're so breathtakingly disingenuous. I mean, it, yeah, so I, that's just a sort of word of caution of people who like thinking politically how you deal with this, that, you know, they're, they're not doing this for like rational technocratic reasons, but that's why we need to press the case there, I think. Um, and they will, that will only matter if, if they're politically challenged. Okay. <laughs> There's a layer of local as well. And um, like you were saying, um, Tom, you were talking about this whole argument of, well, the, the, the technology has changed. But if we think about the last couple of years and the importance at local radio level and the kind of hand that's been held out to the community, the closer community and how important that's been and how, in a sense, it feels as if we went backwards in a sense because of how important that connection was with the community and local radio, then th then that argument doesn't hold water anyway, does it? Yeah, completely. I mean, if we think about, like, well, look back to the Cane Cross Review and what's happening with, the, with, lo with local journalism, it simply doesn't exist in the commercial sector. And the way that that's been basically resolved by this government is to take some of the license fee and then hand that out to these various kind of failing corporate entities that don't have any interest in providing local journalism but again it's a public good that will not be provided by the private sector that's why you need to have public institutions so I'm really glad you mentioned local journalism because I think Dorothy also mentioned like local culture earlier and it's just like they these companies do not have a commercial interest in doing this so if 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 the requirements are removed then you just get news deserts. I mean, that, that's what happens. And that's, that's why local journalism is so important. If you ask people what they want, like local journalism is, local issues, local journalism is always really high. What, but what does the market provide? It never provides that. You know, we have this sort of like idea that the markets give people what they want, but they do not. That's the problem. Dorothy? Well, speaking to that point, I started out in, regional current affairs at ITV and ITV still makes brilliant regional news but it doesn't make all the regional current affairs it used to make and what happened was that um, when they changed the way that ITV was organized the new companies that took over all undertook to make a uh, really good uh, regional current affairs. It didn't take that long before they were going back and going, we're a commercial organization. How can you expect us to make regional current affairs? And that the, 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 the regulator and the government said, well, that's okay. You don't need to make it anymore. And that is my worry about what is going to happen in these new systems that they will Whatever happens, they will just eat away and eat away at what they have to supply. I should say to Tom, I agree with much of what you say, but it ought to be pointed out that all four is the biggest free um, digital service and incredibly popular with young people in this country. And its percentage of advertising is going up remarkably and it's now actually a significant percentage of Channel 4's overall income. I, do, I actually don't think that Channel 4 should give up having advertising. I think it was a brilliant idea of a Conservative government to have a channel where independent companies make the programmes and the funding of it comes from advertising. So it doesn't cost me any money, but because the public owns it, it's protected. Okay. Can I just briefly well, I, I, to that? Very quickly, because I'd like to move on. 
Yeah, sure. Um, okay. I, I think the original model, um, what made Channel 4 good, good wasn't that, was that it was taking money from the ITV companies that originally sold the advertising, right? So that shifted under the 1990 Broadcasting Act. So what was good about that was it had the sort of firewall between the advertising and the commissioning. What I'm saying is we, we don't need to take public money. We could just take money from online advertising, from a levy, in the same way as it was funded by the ITV companies initially. So it's basically closer to the original model but I, I'm, I'm not saying you you know that th this is this would be my my preference and I think some of the commercialization of Channel 4 which happened around the same time as what you mentioned with the ITV companies unfortunately has been the sort of creeping commercialization and I think I think we can address that. Okay I, I think we've given a fair uh, crack to Channel 4 um, can I encourage people, I'm just looking to send in some questions, please, so that we can begin to fire them at the panel. I just wanted to move on a bit now to the whole question of the BBC, because clearly what Peter was talking about was the evidence for the BBC and its popularity and its diversity and its value for money of the licence fee now. Um, but clearly... There, there is going to be a quite a fundamental debate about what happens to the BBC. And it's absolutely um, clear as well that the licence fee, because of the way the government can use it and has used it as a way to strangle the BBC. I think in the book, you, Peter and Patrick, you talk about a 30% cut in real terms of the licence fee since 2010. And what Nadine Doris did when she simply threw, as Doris had said, the red meat, freeze the license fee for two years, this was simply another quite blatant uh, way of um, almost battering the BBC. So I think we do need to look um, to the future. I, just, just one plug. Uh, Media North has just done a pamphlet called Uncertain Future, Why the BBC Must Survive. Uh, we'll put it on the chat how you can get hold of a copy because a lot of the points that have been made about the BBC in terms of its lack of transparency and in terms of some of its vulnerability to political pressure in the way it's reported news, we try and cover these there. So can we move on just very quickly to look at some just one or two key points that we need to be focusing on in terms of what do we do to, if you want, put forward proposals which will seek to defend the solid the structures, the political and sort of structures with it, within the BBC, public service broadcasting. In other words, to in, try to avoid the kind of political pressures and create some kind of independence for the BBC, both in terms of its financing, but also in terms of the way it operates on a day-to-day basis. Can I ask Somebody to start off with that one, please. Nobody drop it, going to drop it on this. I could start, sure. Um, Go on. I mean, I, I think number one, I mean, I've mentioned this, uh, made a lot of the points already in my initial remarks. I, I think the um, the control that the government has, the influence, is a better word than control, uh, over, over the BBC is problematic. I think we need to recognise that. As I said, it's relatively uncontroversial now but the to, but there was a point at which you know mentioning this stuff was perhaps less obvious but I think we've gone through several charter renewals and license fee um, settlements which were secretive and which were overtly punitive politically which has made the stakes very very clear so therefore we what I have advocated what we've advocated the media reform coalition is you get rid of any government's powers appointment of appointments over these organizations you need to have a genuinely independent broadcaster both in terms of its funding in terms of its governance um, in terms of its broader culture now i would like to see a much broader um shift at the bbc as well away from the sort of london centric elite and to be more devolved because at the moment what you've got is all the resources at the center which is sort of t tied up with these like uh with, you know with the sort of london-based elite and by which i mean like the politicians and the business interests and the rest of it they're all in their closed westminster conversation and what the bbc should be doing which is what everybody's been saying in the, in this panel is it should be helping us 
understand the society of which we're part and our place in the world. That's what it should be doing, not reporting to us what politicians say. So it needs to be made more independent of um, government because it's that it's at that core of the BBC, that politicised core, where you get the sort of small C conservatives and where it's very difficult to for its performance role. And then when you get out to the um, sort of peripheries of the BBC, like in local radio and stuff like that, um, you get much higher levels of independence, but then lower resources. So that, that's the problem. I think you need to have a sort of, if you like, a levelling out of the BBC as an organisation, sorry to use a horrible political cliche. Um, so the BBC needs to be independent, and I think it needs to be more devolved, and it needs to explore ways of um, developing more interactive, democratic um, relationships with, with the audience it represents. Because naturally, if you take away the forms of like formal political accountability to the, to the state and make the BBC more independent, then you need to engender alternative forms of, of accountability. And that's important for the BBC's legitimacy, but it's just important for how the BBC does its job. Like, you know, people aren't gonna magically at the BBC know how to cover X, Y, or Z. You need to be having these kinds of dialogues. Those dialogues at the moment, tend to be in very sort of narrow spaces so we need to open all of that up okay i think the bbc has to be saved first we have to recognize quite how urgent this is quite what a head of steam this particular populist conservative government has built behind it and their capability of doing what they want, even though it makes no sense at all. That doesn't matter. This is a grand project which has to be derailed. And in seeking to derail it, we must make the explanations very, very clear. We can't do 10 things at a time. You can't reform the BBC if it's not there. And I think the fundamental reform that matters above all else is to um, unlock, make the BBC politician proof and unlock its practices and its planning from any government. And that's, a, that's a, an appeal that you can make very simply at, at one go. It, what's happened has been secretive, as, as Tom says, and it's been punitive, and we must point this out. But how exactly to develop it thereafter, I think, is something you have to stage. You people aren't policy wonks. People aren't broadcasting policy wonks. They're very distracted at the moment. Yeah. That is why this government thinks it can do what it wants because people are distracted and because, um, as we've heard, it's red, um, it's red meat for uh, it, uh, the, uh, their own more head-banging backbenchers. So very simple messages need to go out. Very simple kinds of myth-busting needs to be done about the BBC. There is a problem in doing that. Uh, first, the fact that national newspapers, as the MRC has pointed out, um, uh, uh, overwhelmingly um, BBC hostile. We're talking about eight, something like 80% of British national newspapers by print sales are right, uh, uh, conservative, right supporting, billionaire owned. Um, uh, and it's very difficult to get those arguments into those papers ever. We've seen the headlines in the mail. Okay. So All other. Other Sorry. campaigning has to be done now. It's really urgent. Okay, Paul, well, that, do you want to come in? To me, the issue is engagement full stop. As you, as you were saying, uh, as you said there, Peter, people are distracted. And yeah. it is easy to sneak things in. It is easy to go, you know, we were talking about it today and we were talking about the fact that um, I think there were... It was something like there were less, what was it? A ridiculous statistic, like 80% of people did not vote in the mayoral, the regional elections for the, for, yeah. for the mayor. And people are just like, you know what? We've had a tough time. We've been through a pandemic. You know, I'm looking over here. And I think it, the, the challenge at the moment is engagement in any shape or form. So for me, the big question is how? How are you going to do it? How are you going to say this is what's happening? This is what could happen? How are you going to get that message across? I think that's 
the biggest challenge that anyone faces at the moment. It's a media, it is in itself a media planning question because like a lot of what might be called progressive policies, when you put them unbranded to populations in the Anglosphere, you may put them here in America or Australia, unbranded by parties, okay. a lot of progressive quote unquote policies are endorsed. When you put them into the current media structures with brands attached, then they can be reframed in negative ways. So we need to, we need to work out how, in, in media terms, to put these arguments across okay. and how to broaden them out. Who's right. important as well? Who has the discussion? Who's bringing yeah. these things to the fore? I think that's crucial as well. Transparency, I hate right. that word, but absolutely vital to this. Okay. Right, Dorothy briefly. Okay, Dorothy briefly, and then uh, I'd like to open it up to the audience. Uh, well, I have taken part in several debates about the BBC and about Channel 4, and the problem is it's a group of people all speaking to each other who agree yep. with each other because they can't get that message out there anywhere else. A thing that we have not said sufficiently is the total campaign of war against the BBC in right-wing newspapers. I mean, sometimes it's daily and they're absolutely spurious attacks on things that the BBC has allegedly done that are um, apparently absolutely awful and left wing and etc. Uh, so when we have to think, how do we move out from this group of us sitting yeah. here out into the public domain? Who is going to help finance that when we don't have access to those right wing newspapers? OK, well, we've got here a question from Judith Raleigh. How do we get the government to engage in a debate? They simply ignore opposition and carry on as if they had full support. Well, it's clear from the Channel 4 uh, privatisation consultation they didn't and they ignored it. But that's that's a question to start with. Who wants to pick that one up first? Well, I think um, you know, the government has to go through legislative processes. And when they do that, they have to they're forced to justify some of the stuff that they're doing. They will you have to you have to have parliamentary opposition and then you have to have of course pop popular sorts of campaigns and mobilizations that we've just discussed I mean I think to an extent that has to be the kinds of pressure that people then put the sort of political elites if you like under um, in terms of getting them to push back on the stuff which isn't popular because uh, as Peter said things don't have to be popular to work them way through the kinds of political systems that we have it, it re relies on us being able to mobilize and make key political interventions now at the media reform coalition you know we're trying to develop relationships and campaigns with other organizations which can be able to to take the conversation out where out there and outside of those sort of policy circles which have been discussed the only thing i would add to what's been said before is i, I think we might be letting the um, politicians a little bit off the hook here. I mean, like Labour's been completely asleep on this. Yeah. I mean, yeah. When, yeah. you know, and in terms of like people being concerned about these issues, if you put more of a positive offering in front of people and Labour could get on the front foot, things might be a little bit different. But all that happens is the government says X, Y, or Z, and then Labour makes some statement of, oh, we don't agree with this. And then that, that's not going to drive any news agenda. It's not going to inspire any public debate. Mm -hmm. If, you know, they could, for example, say, look, Here's Labour's policy. Labour's policy is we remove any kind of political influence over the BBC because of the way this government's been behaved, right, has behaved. That puts the government on the back foot, having to explain why they wouldn't do that. I would like to hear government ministers go on the BBC and explain why they should be able to appoint people to the BBC, why they should be able to influence the BBC's funding, because that puts them in an awkward position. But there is no initiative from this Labour Party. And in fact, you know, the only time I've seen any positive development on, on policy was when Jeremy Corbyn was doing it. It wasn't even his brief. It was supposed to be Tom Watson. Sleep at the wheel for years. And we're not seeing anything from Starmer's Labour either. So, yes, we absolutely need popular mobilisations and we can't depend on 
the politicians, but let's not let them off the hook here. Um, they should be speaking up for public service broadcasting in a much more forthright and informed way. And that will then be other people start to engage in the issue. But they don't hear anything for Labour. They just feel, oh, well, maybe it's not an issue. Yeah. Right. OK. Any other quick responses and move on to another question? Anybody else on that point? No? OK, let me move on to this. This is a question from Scott Dart. And it linked in, 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 in one, one way. Uh, Scott Dart would love to see Channel 4 do the news in a totally different way and not even interview politicians. There seems very little merit in it. They're trained to obfuscate, so interview people who can actually discuss the issues in a way that informs rather than entertains with vacuous conflict. Is that not the P public service broadcast remit? I mean, there's a fair point there, isn't there, about... The well, fact can that... I just say, a lot of the time, politicians won't go on Channel 4 News. Uh, I, I, I mean, we, we don't even get their vacuity. But I think the problem with that point is that when members of the public don't see politicians uh, challenged, first of all, they don't hear that challenging debate. But actually, the effect of not seeing them is that they think that the news is biased. And I, I have regularly had to respond to people who have said, you're biased because you don't put Boris Johnson on the television, when in fact, it was that Boris Johnson wouldn't go on the television. So, I mean, we must see our politicians challenge. And it's a point made by me and many others in the past, Margaret Thatcher, Tony Blair even, you name them, they went on TV for lengthy interviews to be challenged. And we don't see that anymore. We just see these short photo opportunities. I did okay. think it was, sorry, I did think it was interesting. Am I on mute? I did think it was interesting that Jon Snow, one of the things that he said in his last programme that was that he was finding it increasingly difficult to hold politicians to account. So in terms of the kind of media training of politicians, I wondered, you know, how much of that is, you know, how much of this holding to account is going to give us anything we can get hold of anyway? You know, if Jon Snow is saying he's finding it hard to hold politicians to account, then that makes me feel a little bit worried. I'm going to be honest. One, one advantage of that is that the public have now got their eyes and ears in to a media trained politician, who deals in roundabout assertions and evasions and so on. You can recognize it a mile off. Mm. I think the problem about dealing with politics is that right across the board, the news organizations have subscribed to the idea that politics is only about politicians. Important politi politics is only about important politicians and that therefore your access to important politicians is more important than understanding the issues and understanding the ways in which other people deal with those issues. So, for instance, I think Fox Pops are completely thrown away yeah. when you could talk to people with an intelligent follow up question like, and why did you say that? Where did you hear that? You know, where's the evidence for that? Instead of having easy box box uh, and, and people saying, I think it's disgusting or whatever. You know, politics is about people. That you then okay. go back with your, um, um, with your film and they, you then attempt to get the politician into the hut. But your stock in trade should not be that you can get X or Y into the studio. Those contacts are valuable, but they're not the only thing. People need to have a big political imagination, a big sociological imagination, all that stuff, and be able to put it into a newscast. OK, I'm conscious of time. L one last question, I think. And you could, could you give a brief response to this? I mean, clearly the BBC has been under attack. And this is a question Increasingly, the BBC is pushed into wasteful and disorientating permanent campaigning to defend itself, presumably. How do we get the BBC out of this de defensiveness and allow it to focus resources 
on what matters. Quick, some quick responses to that, please. I think the problem isn't ju just defensiveness. It's very, the BBC very worried about being proactive, very worried about being seen as hostile. But the fact is, it thinks in a rather me a mechanistic way, if you can demonstrate that you are good boys, then in the ostensible terms that the government has set, then you're <laughs> off the hook. It doesn't work like that. They'll accuse you of something else. You know, just okay. being a good boy is not enough. Okay, Paulette? Is it in the, for me, it's in the diversity of the appointments and the variety of the appointments and um, looking at it from different perspectives. Because I'm sitting in a room of people who here on this Zoom, a room of people who see the world in a very different way to me. I've learned a lot tonight. I found it very interesting. I work for the organisation. I've learned a lot more about it than I do from working with it. But I think it's about the confidence and the bravery of appointments um, and the variety so that the battle that we're having in the BBC is not a battle that is... Um, kind of um just like the same level of people having a fight almost you know there needs to be more diversity there needs to, it needs shaking up i think and i work for them and they pay my bills so yeah that's what i think okay dorothy well i the people that i know who work for the bbc so many of them are afraid and i think the point is well made if you just try and please the government, it, it's not going to do you any good anyway. And they, I would urge BBC journalists to be really brave in this difficult time for them is actually the moment to be brave. Good. Tom? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. The, the only thing I would say is that they, the inclination of the BBC leadership has never been to be brave. Uh, that's just not how they operate. They've always been like this. They've always been quite pathetic in the face of governments and it's not just that they're pathetic people it's 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 built into the structure of the bbc the people at the top have know that they have to go back to these people and ask for money they know they have to go back and ask for a royal charter and so on and so on so that's why i think it's useful for people who are outside of the bbc to be making these arguments because frankly we're, we're we're now relying on people who are appointed by the government who are politically aligned to the government to be making arguments against the government and it's very obvious why that's not going to happen so i think uh, yes, absolutely, everyone who works at the BBC should be brave, but we shouldn't be putting it just on people whose jobs are at risk. It should be everybody who, like like me, who whose job is not threatened by now to speak out, frankly, about the BBC. Um, the reason why they make the arguments they do is, is you know, objectionable, but I'm, I, I think it's, it's sort of rational. There are people at the BBC who make much more interesting arguments. They just never air them because they're not the people who work in like corporate policy and PR and the rest of it. So, you know, they have people in research and development. They have lots of interesting people working in journalism. They have people there who are thinking about the future of the license fee. But it's the okay. people who like... So if you like, manage the relationships with politicians who are call who who earn up two hundred and fifty thousand pounds, who are calling the shots, and I don't think okay. we should expect too much of those people. Uh, Paulette, do you want to come in? I think what I said about um, about variety. Um, I think has, as Dorothy and, and Tom mentioned there as well, has the bravery built into that. But I think there's a you know, I was I was quite scared. I mean, even at the level that I'm at, local radio, and I and I had the privilege of presenting Woman's Hour for a couple of days, and um, it, it you felt that you were dealing with something that was enormous. Even though you know, when I was actually there, the team were great and all of that. But I do think, as you said, that the there's a lot of pressure on people within the BBC, and it needs, like I said before, it belongs to all of us. Um, is it important enough to us, I suppose, is the question. And, you know, we can have these discussions and we can have these discussions with individuals who have made those arguments, you know, like here, have made these arguments for decades. But, you know, in terms then of what, what Tom said about um, what media needs to do to support the society that we want, we might have to rip up a few scripts <laughs> just to kind of get there really and yeah. uh, you know it's it's it break a few eggs to make an omelette it's that isn't it really okay. well look, I'm conscious we're coming to the end I, uh, I just wanted to pick up one point that Dorothy made is which is that clearly the the 
the attacks that we're, the BBC and Channel 4 are going to face over the next months and years. Um, how do we get, we, we really do need, and I think this has come out from tonight, is that in the end, those people that care about public service broadcasting, and all of us do in this panel, have really got to be a bit more organised. I think there's going to be, if there's going to be a war on the BBC, then we need to get ourselves prepared. And, and, and I do think that means, one of the things, I've been involved in media reform for years, and I always think that we, we all come at it from different perspectives, but I think we've got to get all of the union, media unions and the those people who care about the BBC, we need to get together and try and get some coherent bottom line policies that we can campaign around in a united way and begin to roll things back. Because I feel at the moment, uh, and that we've some of the points have been made that post COVID and everything else that's around in the world at the moment, these issues are not getting the attention they deserve amongst the broader public. And that's why I think it's very, the meeting tonight has been very important. I want to thank the panelists for taking part, but also the audience for taking part. I'm sorry we didn't get more time for you, but that's the way it worked out. So thank you ever so much for taking part. Yeah. Just two last plugs. One, if you are not signed up for Media North, you want to get it, please do. And with the publication we've done, you can go to Media North website and you'll find the way to get the pamphlet there. Thanks ever so much to everybody. Uh, Joe, did you want to say anything before we just sign a, off? Just a thank you to you, Grandal, and of course, again, to all of our panellists tonight. So big thanks to Paula Edwards, Tom Mills, Dorothy Byrne and Pete York, um, and to all everyone who's attending tonight. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Night-night. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>